Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Mazeki. For those of you I haven't, I, I mostly familiar faces in here. Um, but I'm Jennifer. I am the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I would like to welcome you to the 2015 One Day and May Teaching Symposium. Um, I believe this is the ninth, maybe longer, uh, annual One Day in May. And the format has changed a little bit over the years, but I certainly hope that today is going to continue what has become a one day, in today, one day in May tradition of invigorating conversation and discussion to get us thinking about our teaching. Um, so as many of you know, I started as director just this year. And to be honest, when I began, I kind of uh, had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> But one of the things I did know was that uh, I wanted uh, part of my focus in this role to be on trying to make meaning of the teacher-scholar model. Um, for those of you who were at the discussion with the president and the provost a couple of weeks ago, you heard me talk about how I think this is a term we throw around a lot at San Diego State, and it seems to mean really different things to different people in different contexts. And uh, my experience is that those differences can make it really challenging for us as a community to think about what it means to be good at our jobs. Um, so I really believe we should be discussing this question about what it means to be a teacher scholar much more, more often, more openly, um, and more specifically. And so I chose this year's theme for one day in May uh, as one way of encouraging more of that conversation. Um, so in particular, I think most people agree that the teacher-scholar model means not just that we are both teachers and scholars, but that we somehow integrate those two roles. Um, and for some people, that translates into talking about research in the classroom or doing research with students. Um, but what I was hoping with this year's theme, scholarly teaching, using evidence to teach more effectively and support student learning, what I was hoping was to get people thinking about another way that we can integrate teaching and scholarship. And that is by approaching teaching itself as a scholarly activity. Uh, and what I mean by that is to think about our teaching as something that follows a scholarly process of investigating what works and what doesn't, in our quest to find the best way to help our students learn. So to help us with this, I am delighted and honored to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Dr. William Buskis. Uh, Dr. Buskis is a distinguished professor in the teaching of psychology at Auburn University and is a former faculty fellow at Auburn's Biggio Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. You have his full bio in your folders, um, so I'll just point out that he has written or edited a slew of volumes and journal articles um, on college and university teaching. His most recent work has been on professional development for graduate students and new faculty, and also on evidence-based approaches to pedagogy. Um, he's won lots of awards for his teaching and his contribution to teaching across the profession. But one of the things I love best about his biography is that he specifically points out that his proudest career achievement is having seven of his graduate students honored with national, national teaching awards. So we are incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Buskus here to help us think about our teaching as a scholarly activity. So please wel join me in welcoming Dr. Buskus to San Diego State. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction, thank you. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? I tend to be very loud, so some of you in the front are going to be blasted into the next room. So I'll try to tone it down a little bit. Everybody's doing OK, I think. Beautiful morning, great place to be in San Diego. Uh, I woke up yesterday morning in Salida, Colorado to six inches of snow. So this is a real pleasant, pleasant change. And I was a little bit worried about getting here because we had to stop on the highway through the mountains because there was a huge accident. People were sliding off the road everywhere. So it's, it's nice to be here safe and sound, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I hope to contribute to the discussion of scholarly teaching that Jennifer has started. And it's been a pleasure to work uh, alongside Jennifer. Uh, she has done a wonderful job in communicating with me and letting me know exactly what she wanted from me. And you don't always get that from 
uh, teaching and learning directors, particularly new ones. So I really appreciate the effort that she's put into it. So she, she actually deserves a good round of applause too. So let's, let's thank her. Uh, just a couple little bit of housekeeping things. Uh, this is a no holds bar presentation. So if you have a question or a comment, you don't even have to raise your hand, just blurt it out. Okay? I've raised five children, I'm used to that kind of thing, so, so don't worry about that at all. Uh, feel free to get up when you want to. Uh, you all know where the restrooms are, there's goodies back there. Um, we're going to finish probably around 10, 10, 10, something like that. We'll take a break and then we'll launch into the workshop uh, right up to lunch. Okay, sound good? Um, before I get started, let me give you a little bit of background um, uh, related to why I am here. Uh, and it's, it's a really long story, but I'm going to make it a really short story. When I was an assistant professor, I uh, got a job at Auburn University. I've been there since 1982, and I was hired to be a laboratory researcher. And indeed, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to do nothing but keep myself tucked away in the lab and research, 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 research. I'm a, sort of an experimental social psychologist, and my interest at that time was human competition. So I was interested in developing models of human competition in the laboratory. Am I blowing you out of the way already? OK. I mean, I can move back. OK. So um, that's what I was going to do. My department head came to me, and he said, Bill, we have a problem. And I knew exactly what that meant. It meant that we have a problem. He's got an idea how to fix it, and I'm going to do all the work. And that's exactly what happened. And the problem was, was that we were throwing graduate students, brand new graduates, first year graduate students, right into the classroom as teachers of record. They had no training. They, they may not even have taken the undergraduate class in the, in the topic that they were supposed to teach, let alone a graduate class. And it was just a mess. And so he wanted me to fix that. And reluctantly, I said yes. I was not tenured or promoted. You know, you're sort of at the behest of the chair or the, uh, the head at that point. So I said, certainly. The problem is that I became so fascinated by these problems that I took a huge left turn, and I haven't been in the laboratory since that time. And I have to tell you that it has been a fun ride. I, I can't imagine ever having a better career in doing what I've done. It's just, it's just been a pleasure. Uh, you get to meet wonderful people who love to talk about teaching. You get to learn a lot about teaching. You get to learn a lot about what really matters in the classroom and why we should care. And so. That left-hand turn, even though it was an accident, was one of the best things that ever happened to me. People often say, you don't plan a career, you have a career. And that's what had happened to me, because my plans certainly did not work out the way I thought they would. So you have to know that I have a passion for this kind of, of, uh, of stuff. So I'm very glad to be here to share some of my ideas with you. Um, I always like to begin with sort of an overview of where we're going to go. Uh, I want to sort of give you a roadmap. We're going to start in an unusual place. Rather than jumping right into the scholarship of teaching or scholarly teaching, I'm going to sort of run through a couple of models of college and university teaching. Uh, then I'm going to move into um, a larger discussion of what actually goes into teaching. Because if you're thinking about becoming a scholarly teacher, you need to examine those variables. And the variables are many, and they are fascinating. This is a dynamic, fluid process that we're talking about, and it's unpredictable in many cases. A lot of fun to think about. Uh, then we're going to finally, I mean finally move into this concept of scholarly teaching and what we call SOTL, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. And that's a term that's been sort of bandied about since about 1990 in Ernst Boyer's work with the Carnegie Foundation. He, he's really the one who sort of set the, the ball in motion here. And finally, I'm hoping that um, we, we do some good thinking. That we, 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 I want you to take this personally, because teaching is a personal matter. Pe teaching certainly is not objective. Okay? It's not something that we do from a distance. We invest ourselves. We invest our emotion. Students are certainly there emotionally. And as we'll find out, that emotion plays a huge role in what you can do with students in the classroom. It may, in fact, be more important than anything else. So that's sort of where we want to go today. Uh, I also like to start with a, a quotation for the day just to sort of get you thinking about things. This quotation comes from uh, Dan Bernstein. And Dan is the former director of the Teaching and Learning Center at the University of Nebraska. He just retired. Um, I interviewed about um, 11 or 12 TNL directors uh, in the last four or five years because I wanted to get a better notion of what it meant to be an excellent teacher. And so this is what Dan had to say. 
I'm going to read these quotations as they come up for benefits of the recording. So I, I know you all can read probably better than I can. Okay. Excellent teachers design meaningful performances that allow students to demonstrate a deep, critical, and transferable understanding of the central ideas and goals of the course. Excellent teachers are well informed by current evidence about effective instruction, select from and adapt those methods for their courses, and refine instructional practice by tracking students' learning on the goals they set. In other words, from Dan's point of view, teaching is an empirical process. It's important to sort of figure out what we're doing and if it's working. And if it's not working, to change it. If it is working, find a way to make it even work better. Okay. So sort of, sort of keep this in mind. That this is what the best teachers do. They're all very concerned about student outcomes, particularly learning and, and enjoyment of the course. Sometimes we forget about that. We focus so much on those learning outcomes that we forget all about the student's experience. And that, believe me, if the students are not having a good experience, they're not going to learn as much as they could. Because what, what being happy in the classroom does is it makes those students more receptive to your message. Okay. So when we think about building student learning, learning outcomes, we always think that you know, after this course, the student should, okay, you need to throw in, students should enjoy the course, okay. as should you, as should you. So here's my introduction to, to the two, two models of teaching. One is what I call the thumb drive model. Okay, you're all familiar with this little gizmo here. It's a wonderful gizmo. My whole life is on this. Okay, I lose this and I am totally screwed. <laughs> Many people approach teaching as if students are simply a little thumb drive. And I'll, I'll give you more of that in a minute. The second model is a much more comprehensive model that was first suggested by Joe Lohman back in the mid-90s. And then a graduate student and I have developed that model a little bit. And I'm going to share a little bit about that model with you. So let's talk about the thumb drive model first. It begins, of course, with a teacher. The teacher is someone who has a, a, a set of skills or um, has a body of knowledge that is intended to be shared with someone else. Okay. That's what we all, we're all of us are teachers here. That, that pretty well defines all of us. We are hired because we know something. And our job is to sort of give that information away to students. Okay. Intervening in that model is what we call knowledge, okay. what, what we know, those skill sets. And then finally, placed at the lowest level of the model, we actually have the student. Okay. And I place the student below the other two because many faculty around the country, in this country and others, see students as below them. They don't adopt sort of a junior colleague model that where you're, you serve, true, serve as a true mentor. Okay. So the whole idea is for me to take what's here and have a brain dump here, OK? Because this is the way teachers view the brain, the student, right here. And your job is what? When I give a test, is to perfectly replicate that information back again, just like a thumb drive. I mean, it's, it's such a great model for that. Now, this is the most common way of teaching. This is, historically, this is how teaching began. Okay. You sort of had someone who was to fill the room, or sometimes an auditorium or whatever, with knowledge. Okay. The student's job is to sit at that person's feet and soak it up. Okay. That's the historical model of teaching in this country. All of us fall into this model. I've done it. You've all done it. Okay. This is sort of the straight lecture method. I don't have a lot of time to get students involved in the course. I don't want to put a lot of time into this course. Uh, my dean's after me, my head's after me because I need to spend more time in the lab. So I'm going to be quick and dirty. I'm going to prep as soon as I can. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to dump this information out, and then I'm going to scatter to the lab as soon as I can. I'm not going to stay after class to meet with students. Uh, if there's a question in class, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, we don't have time for that. Okay. Or I'm going to say, you know, you can get that in the book. Okay. Uh, or um, why don't you email me? You know, sort of scapegoat. So this is, a, this is a very common model. Now, having said all that in a very derogatory fashion, some people are very good at this model. And we shouldn't get in those people's way. Some of those lectures are absolutely a goldmine. They're inspiring. They change lives. That is a skill that most of us in this room don't have, myself included. Okay. So we should be teaching in a different way. Okay. So let me contrast that with a different model. We start. Again, with the teacher. 
But now we sort of begin to understand that there's more to the teacher than simply a reservoir of knowledge. I bring into the classroom, you bring into the classroom a whole host of variables. What kind of mood am I in? What's my expertise? Have I had training in this course? Have I had training teaching? Okay. Did I just uh, walk into my classroom after getting a rejection letter from a publisher? Okay. Okay. Did I have a fight with my wife? Okay. My dog's sick. I had to run it to the vet before class. All these kinds of things figure into who we are on any given day in the classroom. So a teacher is not a teacher is not a teacher is not a teacher. Okay. There's great variety across teachers and within the individual. Okay. All depending upon what's happened in that person's life. So we have to think about how those variables affect the student experience. How they affect our clarity of expression. We also know that not all knowledge is created equal. Some stuff is just stuff, tough, excuse me. Some stuff is just tough. It's hard to get across. Some stuff is so easy, I don't even know why, why I have to take time to teach it. Well, if you know what's easy and what's hard from the student's perspective, then you can sort of really control your time a lot better in terms of how you prepare for that class. And many of the models of teaching that we see today have that as a central focus. Why teach students things that they already know? or they can learn very easily. Why not spend more time on the most difficult concepts? But of course, you've got to figure out what those difficult concepts are. Likewise, students vary. I mean, this is, this is a huge, huge issue. Where do you teach? Do you teach to the kids up here? Teach to the kids down here? Teach to the middle. They come with different backgrounds, academic backgrounds, different learning histories, different motivation for teaching. But they're all our students. And whatever they come to us with, that's the job we have, pure and simple. This is what a lot of faculty don't get. Because they think their only job is the dissemination of information. They forgot that part of their job is also to set the occasion, to create the environment so students become receptive to that message. And if that happens, wonderful things occur. Students change attitudes about a class. They change the attitude about education. I finally had a teacher like that in my junior year. I shouldn't tell you this, but I graduated with a 2.67 GPA. Okay. I had the GRE waived for me. Okay. I was a real basket case, real pathetic. Okay. But in my junior year, my, my second, uh, year, second semester of my junior year, I had a professor who really turned me on to education. And that person is the reason why I'm here today. Really, really changed my whole attitude. It became fun. Not in a ha 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 type of way, but in like, whoa, that is so interesting. I want to know more. And you know, when I went through that transition, people didn't recognize me afterwards. I was not the same person. That's what a teacher did. And I am so grateful for that. So grateful. Students have different ways that they learn. I'm not talking about learning styles here. I'm talking about study strategies. Okay? I'm not a big believer in, in learning styles. Okay? The data don't really support that anything along those lines exists. But students do have good ways to approach their studies and poor ways to approach their studies. The key is, is to teach your students how to study in the process. Okay. You see how complicated and messy this is compared to the thumb drive model? Then we have different ways to teach the different techniques. Sometimes the lecture is the go-to method, and it works well. Sometimes, though, we may want to increase the interaction of the class because they need a hands-on experience. So we use something like a, a PBL platform, problem-based learning, or use of case studies, or some other form of what we call, in the broad sense, active learning. Okay. So there's different ways to approach the teaching of our topic, depending upon how difficult that topic is and other variables, and the nature of the class that we have. Okay. The size of the class matters. I believe that you can do almost anything in a large class that you can in a small class but it takes a lot more effort. Okay? And you have to have a teacher who's courageous because it takes guts to experiment at that level. Okay? Not everybody has that. When you do this well, one of the outcomes you create is excitement in your students about the topic, an intellectual excitement. They begin asking questions. They begin to want to know more. They take more time in their studying. They're having fun. They're discovering what college is all about, much like I did late in my, my career. Surrounding this dynamic 
is an incredibly important variable that, for the most part, has been ignored. And that is the social context in which teaching takes place. We forget that teaching is a social process. If you're a lecturer, you think it's a monologue. There doesn't have to be an audience out there. You get up there, you know, it's 9 o'clock, you start, and you don't shut up until 10 of 10. Who, who cares whether they're listening or not? You're just going. You've all had lectures like that. It doesn't matter what's going on out here. Okay? I, I've sat in classes as a, a peer reviewer, and I've seen students go online and shop. They got their credit card out and everything. Okay? <laughs> Because the teacher's not paying attention. Okay, now I may be paying attention to this side of the room. This is I, you're my favorites. This is where all the, the bright ones are sitting. But what about these folks over here, the ignorant and the dull? Okay, pardon me. Okay, no worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah, you're laid back. <laughs> okay, they're getting away with murder while I'm holding you folks accountable, and you see it happen. And you know. As a teacher, we all have these little um, issues that we deal with in terms of how we monitor our classroom. <laughs> That's nice to know. <laughs> um, for lack of a better term, we call that social context rapport. That is, the connection that the teacher establishes, the emotional climate, how safe the students feel. Now, I'm not talking about being buddies. You know, let's go out drinking. You know, have my baby. We're not talking about those kinds of things, okay? <laughs> what we're talking about is being friendly without being friends. Okay. In other words, be nice. It's that simple. Be nice. Okay. For those of you who have seen the movie Roadhouse, you know what I mean, okay? Because that's the first rule of a good bouncer. You're nice until it's no longer time to be nice. Okay? And then you've got to be firm. Okay? So when, when we're talking about rapport, we're talking about things like knowing students' names. And many of you teach large classes, and it's impossible for many of you to learn that many names, although it can be done with a lot of effort. But sometimes it's just a matter of being courteous and respectful, getting to class a few minutes early, early sitting down and saying, hey, my name is Bill. You are Teresa. Okay, nice to meet you. Okay, how's class going? Just having a little conversation. Do that with your students. It'll blow them away. Okay? But make sure you don't always do it with the same student. Okay? <laughs> okay? You, you, you sort of want to get around. Okay? Um, uh, a good friend of mine, Janie Wilson, who's one of the uh, leading researchers on rapport, um, she does something as simple as send out a, a welcoming email a day or two before classes begin. Simply says, hi, my name's Janie Wilson. I'm going to be your teacher in statistics this semester. I'm really looking forward to it. This is going to be a fun class. I know many of you are sort of a little bit afraid of statistics. You're worried about numbers and calculations, but we're going to get through it. I promise you we'll get through it. Looking forward to meeting you next Monday. Have a great weekend. That's simple. How long does it take to write an email like that? Probably less than two minutes. Fire it off. And what does it do to the students? It's like, wow, I've never had a welcome like that from a professor before. Okay? I'm going to begin to look forward to this class a little bit more. Okay? Simple things like that. The easiest thing in the world to do is simply come to class and smile. Okay, think about it. Students want to be in a room with a person who also wants to be there. Okay? Smiling is free. It doesn't cost anything. So one of the point I'm trying to make here is that, is that in this set of issues, variables, we call the teacher, knowledge, students, learning strategies, teaching techniques, that all takes place within a larger context. And for the most part, researchers have forgotten that. Okay? Because almost all of the research takes place there. So what I want to do today is to sort of open your eyes and your minds to a larger playing field. Okay? So today I want you to focus on all of it. I want you to think about it all. Okay. There are so many places to begin thinking about how to become a better teacher. And once you start thinking about how to become a better teacher, you ask yourself questions like, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I change this? What if I modify just a little bit here? Okay. So you open up fascinating new ideas and new worlds to explore. 
And one of the reasons why all of us went into academics is because we're curious people. We're more curious than the average person. And that gets us into trouble. That's why we're always busy, okay? Because so many things interest us. And now I'm throwing another one at you, okay? But this is more interesting than anything else. Okay. Here's a quote from a gentleman I mentioned earlier, Joe Lohman. Um, he wrote a book called Mastering the Techniques of Teaching, published in 1995. And basically what he did in that book was to uh, publish results of a factor analysis that he did looking at letters of recommendations for um, award-winning teachers in the North Carolina system. He's at, he's at Chapel Hill. But here's what he had to say. The ability to stimulate strong, positive emotions in students is what separates the competent from the outstanding college teacher. So you can be competent, but not necessarily really good. At, at the, you know, Bill McKeechee, who I know many of you have heard of before, he always says the good news is that if you're smart enough to get a, a job as a college teacher, you're smart enough to be a good teacher. And Joe's point and my point is that why stop there? Why settle with just being good when there are so, much, so many other things that you can do to become even better? This is Parker Palmer who wrote a book back in 98 called The Courage to Teach. And he is still uh, very active in higher education circles. The Courage to Teach is a really soft book. It's a really sort of a, what you describe as a touchy-feely book. Uh, but he has had such a, high, a huge impact on higher education, I thought that I would give the book a good read. And I'm really glad I did. I really benefited from it. And one of the things that I got out of the book can be summarized by this one line in the book. Good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and integrity of the teacher. In other words, you can be a bad teacher with a new technique. You just find a new way of being bad. Okay? What really matters is what you bring to the classroom. You make the difference. You know, 10 years from now, when you run into a student on the street, they're not going to remember, you know, one one-hundredth of the facts and figures that you shared with them but they're going to remember that experience in your classroom. That's what they will remember. And that remembrance, is, is, it, it can be either a horrible remembrance or a very fond remembrance. And if it's a very fond remembrance, you've probably had some impact on their lives in terms of how they're looking at the world, the choices they made, uh, and who they became as a professional or even as a person. Most teaching conferences are going to focus on techniques. People want to go there. They want to get the latest whiz-bang you know, trick to bring to their class so they can wow the students. Parker Palmer says it's deeper than that. Teaching is more important than that. You've got to be somebody that the students can trust. Along those lines, uh, with this particular model that, that we've developed, and this is Jared Keeley with, with whom we've developed the model, um, I wanted to sort of provide you an example of some of my own scholarship, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one. Um, we have developed what is called the Teacher Behavior Checklist, the TBC. And if you open up your uh, notebook or your handouts, you'll see that on page two and then on page three, I've given you a sample of how one of the uses that we've found for this document. Let me, let me just give you a little bit more background. When I was given this charge of training graduate students how to teach, eventually it led me to the question of, of like, what do I need to know to do this job? So I thought to myself, why don't I study what it means to be a great teacher? And there's a big literature out there, huge literature. The problem with that literature is that it's a literature of lists. And that li those lists are comprised of personality qualities that say, be approachable, be accessible, be funny. The question is, is how do you do those things? Fundamentally, those are qualities that have to be reduced or translated into behavior. Thus, the teacher behavior checklist. So what we wanted to do is discover what behaviors constitute key qualities of excellence in teaching. So that's where we started. And when we collected data, and we've, this has been an ongoing study now for, uh, well, ongoing research for about 12, 14 years, um, we found that through factor analysis, we came up with two basic categories 
that relate to teaching excellence. One is what we call professional competency. And I'll, I'll share with you uh, those, those qualities in just a minute. The other is rapport. Every study since 1923, when the first study was done, factor analytic study was done, of teacher evaluations has broken it down to the same two factors. So we've got a lot of replication here. We've got a lot of confirmation. So what you have before you is what we use as a, uh, a set, um, a student evaluation of teaching, or an SEI, student evaluation of instruction. So what it allows students to do is to rate their professors on a one to five scale. My teacher never does this. My teacher always does this for each one of those 28 qualities, slash behaviors. The advantage that we have in this particular set is that each one of those qualities is defined. So that if you were to evaluate me as a teacher, each one of you would have the same, exactly the same set of criteria. So rather than having my teachers approachable and you define it your way, Larry here defines it a different way, okay? Teresa defines it yet a third way. Stephen defines it a fourth way. Now you're all dealing from the same definition, which is a huge advantage when you're trying to figure out how to improve teaching. So if a teacher scores low on a particular attribute, you can take a look at those behaviors and say, well, you know, why don't you try some of these, see what happens. So in our factor analysis, I just wanted to show you this. We have uh, come up with some very uh, high numbers that show sort of the credibility of the instrument. I would have never, as a graduate student or as an early researcher, set out to do this kind of research. Okay? I, 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 this was a whole different world away. But this is one of the things that sort of I was led to as a result of being faced with particular problems in the classroom. These are the 11 factors that load on the professional competency subscale. There's 11 of them. And you can see the definitions in the handout. We will be using this handout during the workshop for you to do a self-assessment. You will actually do a self-rating of yourself here. And keep in mind that your self-rating will probably be more generous than what students would give you. Okay. <laughs> so these are the factors that load on being caring and supportive, what we call the rapport subscale. Students pay attention to what we do. So that if you rush into class late, that conveys to them that you don't care. Okay? Because it's saying, you know, I'm, I'm, this is sort of an afterthought. I'm considering you now at the last minute. And then when you rush out, the same thing. Students pay attention. They're like our children. So we can put these two factors in a nice matrix. And we can sort of see, you know, here we have, you know, high professional competency but low rapport. And we know a lot of teachers like this. Really, really bright people, okay? They're pretty good communicators, but they have no connections with their students. Sometimes they even make students feel stupid, okay? Here's where you don't want to be, okay? You don't want to be here. This is where you want to live. This is where you want to hang out. This is a good place. And then you know you have high PC, low, low rapport, or you have low PC, high rapport. You know, you're going to be okay, but you're holding yourself back there. The idea is, is that to be a good or even an excellent teacher, you need not to only be able to communicate with your students, be professionally competent, but you also be able, excuse me, have to be able to connect with them. You have to have that connection. And that begins on day one. So to sort of move back now to take a look at the larger picture of scholarly teaching and the scholarship of teaching and learning, there, there are two types of questions where we all begin. One is personal. That is, it's only about you. And that is, what can I do to become a better teacher? And it's okay to be selfish in that sense. And many of you in the audience are here, okay? You're, you try to find ways to tweak what you do. Have fun with it, experiment with it. Okay. Other people stand back and they say, well, I wanna talk about the larger picture. I wanna take a look at how 
things occur in teaching and learning beyond my classroom. So I want to look at topics, okay, in a much more broad sense. Okay. Generally what happens is you start here, and if you become fascinated, you're going to want now to communicate to a larger audience. So this is where scholarly teaching begins and often resides. Once you start presenting that information to a larger audience and publishing it, it moves here. Okay. So really here what we have is scholarly teaching. What we have here is scholarship of teaching and learning. This follows the same rules as any kind of published research or formal presentation. So here's some examples. Am I using the most effective teaching methods for my topic? So I teach research methods. That's one of the courses I teach. How should I teach that? Should that be a, a straight up lecture course where I lecture about different kinds of research design, different kinds of statistics? Or should it be more of a hands-on course? And if it should be a hands-on course, what should those hands-on activities include? Okay. So it's a very personal, restricted question to my class. Okay. Another one you might want to ask yourself, um, do my examples and demonstrations work? So that means you've, you've got to design some research. Okay. You've got to sort of give the demonstration, maybe in one format or another, make some comparisons, collect some data, and then make a determination whether your students get it or not. Another one might be, oop, how good are my tests? Are my tests really capturing what I'm intending to teach? Are my tests really capturing what I want my students to know? Are my students retaining that information That's a question we don't often think about. We, we just sort of think in terms of the immediate test. Do they get it? How well did they do? Not will they remember it. More in general, types of questions we might ask, which pedagogical methods produce the most effective and durable learning? What aspects of the teacher most powerfully influence student learning? Most researchers have subtracted the teacher out of the equation. And they've simply looked at techniques or um, approaches to learning. Or, you know, compared like a PowerPoint presentation versus lecture, with or without notes, you know, different ways that students take notes, those kinds of things, okay. But they left us out of it. But I can tell you from experience, we are, we're the prime mover. It doesn't happen without us. What can be done about students who repeatedly perform poorly in their classes? You know, a lot of us are sort of concerned about that upper end. We love those folks. They're our kind of people. We want to hang out with them. But what about those kids who either don't get it or who have sort of tuned out? How do we reach them? How do we change them around? How do, they, how do we help them become more like our A and B students? What can we do? So these are just like right off the top of my head types of questions that all of us can ask. So to finally get to the definition of scholarly teaching, here's a good, good way to look at it. This is not my definition. I have borrowed this from different sources. The process of collecting data on aspects of your teaching and using those data to develop practices to improve your teaching effectiveness. For example, student learning. But again, I want to remind you, student learning is not the only outcome of an educational process. How does it change the students in other ways? I mean, one of the things that I really like to see is when I can take a student who doesn't have very much confidence in herself and work with that student to provide some sort of mastery skills in that domain, a whole new world opens up for that person. I mean, it's like magic. It's like, wow. I mean, don't you love those evaluations that say, I was not looking forward to this class. I was really dreading it. Uh, I'm not very good at math. I'm not very good at this, that, or the other. I was so surprised at how much I enjoyed this class and how much I learned. I didn't get an A, but I feel really good about the work I invested in the class and how well I did. The, those are the keepers. Those are a lot of fun. Okay. In scholarly teaching, no attempt is made to share that information with others. And that's the, really the only distinction between scholarly teaching and the scholarship of teaching, okay. is that we don't take it public. The advantage of taking it public is first that we share this really good information. We, we, we 
prevent people from reinventing the wheel. The second is that it helps our own careers in terms of publications and presentations, of scholarly contributions to the field. But there's a caveat, and that caveat is if your institution counts that as scholarship, because many institutions do not. They look down on teaching research, okay, because it's not real research. Okay. But I promise you, it can be every bit as rigorous and probably as important, if not more important, than other types of research. Early in my career, when my department head got me involved in this massive undertaking to correct the ills of introductory psychology and the way we were doing it at Auburn University, I came to him. His name is Peter, was Peter Harzen. He passed away a couple years ago. I came to him and I said, Peter, I, I'm really fascinated by this. I, I just can't get enough of this. I, I just love the kinds of questions that we can ask about teaching and learning in the classroom. And I said, but I'm worried because I don't want to go back to the laboratory. And, and that's going to kill my career. I was really worried. I said, I don't, want, I don't know what to do. And Peter, in his very typical uh, London Turkish accent, said to me, and I can't repeat it, so I'm not going to make a fool of myself. Um, he said, look, at the, you know, the answer is very simple. And this is what he would always say to me when I came to him with a question. Yeah, Bill, the answer is very simple. Okay. And I said, well, please tell it to me because I'm, I'm much below simple. Okay. He said, which audience is more important to you? Who do you want your audience to be for your career? And I had never thought about that before. So I thought to myself, geez, I could go back to the lab, you know, take anywhere from six months to a year to go through the IRB process, to conduct the research, to publish it, only to have it rejected with a resubmit. And this process could go on for a couple of years. And then if it's published, maybe 25 people will read it. And maybe five will get it. Okay, not because it's so highfalutin, but because it's so technical these days. And then I thought to myself, every time I get up and I teach introductory psychology, I've got the chance to influence what 500 students think about my discipline and what they think about higher education and how they see their roles in the world relative to what they're learning in my class. It was a no-brainer at that point, absolutely no-brainer. So I decided then to become more involved in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So I could still get credit. And I was promoted uh, twice through my, my teaching research. So it can be done. It can be done. So just in contrast, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the scholarship of teaching and learning. Much teaching research is qualitative. Uh, a good bulk of it is um, quantitative, very rigorous. Oftentimes, multiple studies. Oftentimes, very high impact. Very high impact. So there's no reason to sell yourself short. So if you've got a great idea about how you approach teaching personally, and you set up the right empirical conditions and come up with very clear answers, there's no reason why you shouldn't share that information with others. There's no reason why you shouldn't get more mileage out of those ideas. The classroom is the perfect natural laboratory. We've, we've got our participants right there. All we need to do is step back and view it from a different lens. It's not simply about instruction. It's about how to do instruction even better. And it is so much fun. It's a ball. It's a blast. It is addictive. It is addictive. Here are some of the kinds of broader topics that you could think about in terms of um, taking on a project. Textbook use, which is really interesting and sad. Uh, fewer than 50% of the students buy textbooks. Fewer, fewer than 50% of those folks actually read it. Okay. Okay. Um, use of text pedagogy. Okay. My friend David Daniel in the back can tell you all about that. He's done some very nice work. 
So these are just some of the ideas. You know, do help sessions really work? How about different ways to organize the classroom? I mean, everybody today is talking about the flipped classroom as if it's something new. Flipped classroom has been around forever. Okay. Just now we're talking about it in a different context. Are there different ways to do that well? So on this slide, I'm just listing, again, some of the, the good things that can happen as a result of turning your classroom into a laboratory. So there's, you can see there's not much difference between the two. So I'm here today to encourage you all to become more scholarly in your teaching. I'm also here to say that if that's not enough for you, think about going to the next level and actually taking your ideas and publishing them, presenting them at conferences. Every, every discipline in academia has teaching subspecialties. Most of those disciplines have disciplinary teaching journals. And they also have sections within conferences that focus strictly on teaching and pedagogy within that discipline. There are limitations that each of us face. And if you're a, uh, a self-aware teacher, which not everyone is, you will, you will begin to realize what those limitations are. And you'll do one of two, three, two things. One is you'll say, I can't do it. Or you'll say, I can't do it very well, but I'm going to try to learn to do it better. So you're right. There is a, a corrective component, a reflective component that you can bring to bear in this. In fact, that's where it begins. It begins with something that interests you in the classroom. You're thinking about it. It's like, oh, man, I've got to do something about this. What should I do? Where do I start? In all of this research, in SOTL and scholarly teaching, we're looking at some aspect of student learning outcomes. Okay. It could be some skill. It could be some corpus of knowledge. It could be whatever you want it to be. I try to always involve a social component in my research as well. Because I want my students to enjoy it. I want them to have a good time in my class. But there are all sorts of ways to skin this cat. Okay. There are all sorts of ways. The key is, is, as Stephen was getting at, is to sort of consult a larger body of literature out there. And there is a wonderful literature out there on teaching and learning. How many of you own a copy of Bill McKeechee's Teaching Tips? One, two, three, four, five, less than a do dozen. Okay. One of the first things I would do is I would go and take a look at that book. How many of you own a copy of Barbara Gross Davis's um, Tools for Teaching? Probably even fewer. A few more. Okay, good. There are, that, that, they do a good job summarizing that literature. There's a third term that's used out in the field besides scholarly teaching and the scholarship of teaching, and that is EBT, or evidence-based teaching. And this is really the heart and soul of collecting data. I need to collect evidence that shows that a particular method works or that a, a particular method is more effective than another. So when you get involved in this literature and when you start thinking about this, these kinds of things, you're going to come across this concept, evidence-based teaching. And we're going to talk um, a little bit more about evidence teaching uh, later today. There's always a devil. Okay? You can't get around the bad guys. Okay? And in this case, the Satan of the teaching world is the lecture. Almost all evidence-based teaching approaches pit whatever the approach is against the lecture. And so far, they've done a pretty good job. Okay? Because in almost every case, things like problem-based learning, use of case studies, just-in-time teaching, inner teaching, some of these sort of system approaches to teaching are about a letter grade better in terms of traditional student learning outcomes. That's, that's pretty impressive. I mean, to increase your sort of grade by, by that level. There are a couple of ways to, to do EBT. One is to take a look at what I call drop-ins. This is where you take a demonstration or you take an activity like a think-pair-share. Does everybody know what think-pair-share is? Okay. Get students to think about something, they pair up, and then they share so that they have sort of a learn to talk and use the language of the field. You know, does that really increase student learning outcomes when it comes to a quiz or a test? But you just drop it in. You know, you can use it here, you can use it here, you can use it there. 
as opposed to term length systems in which you're using a particular system of teaching for the entire semester. So you don't have to adopt an entire mode for the semester in your experimentation. You can uh, uh, implement simply a here and there type of approach. Team-based learning is an example I've used. How many of you used team-based learning before? Okay, a couple of you, good, good. Almost all, act, uh, almost all EBT systems contain some component of active learning, hands-on. And that's the difference between lecturing and active learning, right there. There's some component that's hands-on. Okay. It almost always involves students communicating with each other. We call that peer tutoring or reciprocal tutoring. There's always some assessment involved that provides feedback back to the teacher. Generally what happens with many of these systems, the whole class is involved. It's not just like a segment here or a segment here, it's the whole class. Oftentimes you're comparing one class section of the class with another section of the class. Or from this semester's class to previous semesters. There's all sorts of comparisons you can make. Here are the most popular forms of, of um, EBT. How many of you use PBL? Okay, case studies. Just in time teaching. This is the wackiest system that you've ever heard of. Okay. The, idea, the idea is, is that you give students an assignment, a series of questions that they've got to answer, and they've got to get those answers back to you just in time for you to create a lecture. So they usually, the, the way Novak set it up, is that you've got two hours. You give students a two, so if your lecture's at 10, students have to respond to you by eight o'clock in the morning, then you've got two hours to learn what the students don't know, and that's what you focus on. Just in time teaching. If you wanna live on the edge, this is where you go. Okay. <laughs> How many of you have heard of inner teaching? It's a, it's a fairly new system, it's one of the newest EBTs, very effective. Very effective, okay? I, I won't take time to explain it today, but you know, uh, Google it, get into it, it's a, it's a really powerful system. Let me see if I can bring this up for you. This, this URL takes you to the website of Kennesaw State University's CETL, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. Uh, go to the drop-down menu, and what you will find is a list of outlets in which you can publish SOTL type of research. Yeah, that's and Now you got the huge one. Okay. Yeah, 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 Th let's not do that. Okay. <laughs> um, they have done a very nice job of providing a long list and the links to disciplinary journals uh, that focus on pedagogy for, for everybody's field here. So it's, it's a really useful link. These are uh, two outstanding sources for publishing research in SOTL. They're international journals. Uh, people often mistake teaching research as being easy, easy to publish. That is so wrong. People think, oh, you know, I, I did this little study, uh, you know, it's sort of neat, I'm going to write it up for publication and I'll pad my beat a little bit. Most of these journals have over an 80% rejection rate. They are tough nuts to crack. So, so don't think that just because you've done a little bit of teaching research that you can just sort of slough it off. You can't. They're as absolutely as rigorous as any kind of specific content journal. So when we, we think about what's at stake here, what, what does teaching do, particularly if you're good at it? Well, the first thing it does is it provides information for students, okay, in the form of knowledge and skill sets. If you are really good at what you do, you engage those students, okay? You capture their interest. That's the first step. If you capture their interest, you have them right here. You can get those students to do anything. Absolutely. Okay. You have a lot of power to change lives when you reach that. So you've got to be an interesting teacher. You've got to come up with good examples. You've got to make this topic come alive. Okay. You want to sort of create a tension in that classroom that students want to experience. Okay. So good teaching informs and it engages. It also inspires, and this is the unsung hero of the teaching world, because we think about just content. You've got to know your stuff. You know, I've got to get Jennifer to know this stuff. 
I want her to do well in my exams. But as a good teacher, I want her to do more. I want her to be inspired by my class to go out and change the world, or at least her life, based on my content. And as a psychologist, that's, that's very important. And we need to think about teaching in a larger perspective, and that is it alters the future. A good teacher will change career trajectories. I didn't think I was going to like psychology. A student might write on a course of evaluation. But after taking this class, I've decided to change my major to psychology. Okay. Or I've decided, you know, I was, I was a sociology major. Um, I took this course, and I decided to go to graduate school in psychology. Okay. There you really had a big impact. So this is what's at stake. The better you are as a teacher, the more likely you're going to have this impact on your students. And this is why scholarly teaching and SOTL are so important, because it informs us about how to do it better. Taking an empirical approach to your teaching has some immediate personal benefits. And that is, it can change the quality of your teaching, particularly if you listen to yourself. You've got to have a pretty thick skin to be a good teacher. You've got to take criticism well. Nobody gets better at anything in this life without feedback. All of us here are products of that feedback, for better or for worse. It increases the likelihood that students will actually pay attention to us. Students will become sort of alive in our classes. But as a whole, it's more than just personal. Because if you start changing your teaching, and 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 you start changing your teaching, what happens now, we have a community. We have a revolution. We have forward momentum towards improving the quality of instruction and the quality of learning and all sorts of other outcomes at the departmental level, at the college level, and at the university level. And if you're worried about retaining students, this is a good place to start. There's no downside to what we've talked about this morning. There's only benefits. It's just a matter of how motivated and how willing you are to take the time to transform your classroom into a laboratory. And we're going to give you a chance to think more about that uh, after the break. And I don't know what this is, but it's beautiful. Okay. In fact, we're all going to go there for our break. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>